So due to the success of last year's video, I thought it was about time to revisit the top five most promising anti-aging compounds, especially because new science has been published in the last year and my opinions have changed, albeit somewhat slightly, and yeah, a lot can happen in a year and so I want this video to be as up to date as possible. And it can be challenging to make such a list as there are more than 200 proposed jury protectors to choose from, and so if something isn't included, that's not to say that I've not disregarded it. Another quick thing, I got a lot of comments last year saying that vitamins should be on my list. My response is that vitamins are defined as essential micronutrients your body needs for proper functioning, so take vitamins as a given. Another thing, here I refer to anti-aging as delaying or reversing biological aging by targeting established molecular mechanisms of aging. I'll explain which molecular mechanisms as we go through it, as I think it's always important to understand how different proposed components are supposed to be working, at least that's my biased biochemist opinion. And there will be timestamps so you can jump around. So okay, enough intro, now for the list, in no particular order. So firstly, unchanged from last year is alpha ketoglutarate, otherwise known as AKG. Now, it was only this week that I made a video showing some recent announcements that AKG seemed to reverse the epigenetic age of participants taking it on average for seven months. Whilst this data looks impressive, I did highlight some missing information from the study. But fortunately, other human clinical trials are in the works that will analyse more measurements. For example, I spoke to Brian Kennedy earlier this year, who was conducting a trial in Singapore. They will also take other measurements besides epigenetic age, including inflammatory markers, pulse wave velocity, and also looking at facial aging. And so AKG itself is a really important metabolite found within our bodies. In particular, it's found in the Krebs cycle, but it can also activate different enzymes and is a component of amino acid biosynthesis in the body, as well as activating different enzymes that can alter epigenetic marks. And a lot of this work builds upon a 2020 study that showed that AKG supplementation improved both the lifespan and health span of mice. Now, whilst the exact molecular mechanisms are still unclear in terms of why boosting AKG seems to have beneficial effects, I added it to my list based on the fact that there are clinical trials in progress and so far, the compound itself is generally recognised as safe. It's important to say though that so far, this is with testing the calcium salt version of AKG. Second on my list is rapamycin and rapalogs. Rapamycin inhibits the protein mTOR, which literally stands for mammalian target of rapamycin. Now, mTOR in the body does many things, but one of them is to promote cellular growth. And so it's thought by inhibiting mTOR activity, it can switch the cell state from growth and proliferation to a more protective state where it can upregulate processes such as autophagy, which help to break down damaged and dysfunctional cell components and recycle them for the cell. In terms of its anti-aging potential, it's worth mentioning that rapamycin was tested by the National Institute on Aging Interventions Testing Program, and it was shown to extend lifespan in both males and female mice, even when it was done intermittently and even when it was done later in their lifespan. And more on from that, there's also a human clinical trial being announced, the PEL trial, that will study the anti-aging potential of rapamycin. And you may recall that I recently spoke with Dr. Brad Stanfield, who's also in the works of conducting a human clinical trial to test rapamycin in addition to exercise. Moreover, rapamycin is already FDA approved and is used as an immunosuppressant drug. And so we already have a lot of data from humans as to safe doses to use in human patients. However, this is why it'd be interesting to see the data from these trials to see if there are any concerns with taking it for longer time periods. It is worth mentioning though that safer ways to inhibit mTOR may come through fasting strategies or by reducing calorie intake and you can find more about that and safety concerns in this video here. But all in all, given that mTOR signalling seems to be a recurrent feature of many pathways of ageing, I definitely think the use of rapamycin can be considered promising. Next up are NAD plus precursors such as NMN, nicotinamide mononucleotides, NR, nicotinamide riboside, and niacin. Given the importance of NAD plus to our bodies as both a redox coenzyme important for metabolism and as a substrate for different NAD plus consuming enzymes, and that a reduction of NAD plus in different tissues is thought to decline with age, the impact of these precursors is interesting to understand. I have a really good video already, well, <laughs> if I do say so myself, on NAD plus metabolism that would definitely be worth watching after this video 
if you haven't already, as we go into way more detail there in terms of the molecular underpinnings. But to summarise here, increasing NAD plus has been shown to extend lifespan in different model organisms. However, more recently, studies conducted by the Interventions Testing Program have shown that nicotinamide riboside didn't actually extend lifespan. But there's also been many studies that have looked at the potential of these precursors to alleviate symptoms of different age-associated conditions. In different model organisms, increasing NAD plus has been shown to protect against age-related declines in mitochondrial dysfunction, physical performance, muscle regeneration, and declines seen in vision. And interestingly, clinical trials in humans have also been announced and are in progress to look at other things such as the impact of these precursors on exercise and cognitive performance. It's worth mentioning that NAD plus precursors can be found in your diet. For example, anemone can be found in broccoli and avocados, and niacin can be found in tuna and salmon, albeit these are at much lower amounts than are used in these different animal studies. But given the interest around these precursors at the moment, and the fact that clinical trials are in progress, however, I've yet to see any data for the use of these precursors that's been published regarding ageing itself. I thought it was mentioning it on our list, as I'm sure we'll find out more information in the coming year. Next up on my list is spermidine, and spermidine is a naturally occurring polyamine, which means it has many different amino groups. And the interesting thing about these groups is that it gives spermidine a positive charge so that it can interact with DNA, RNA and some proteins that have a negative charge. This ability of spermidine to bind various components has led it to be linked with various cellular processes. In terms of longevity, the one that is most frequently cited is the ability of spermidine to promote autophagy, the process I mentioned earlier that can remove unnecessary or dysfunctional cellular components. It's been shown in yeast that supplementation of spermidine promotes longevity via activation of autophagy. And since then, it's also been shown that spermidine extends lifespan in worms, flies and mice. So what about humans? Well, based on food questionnaires, people who consume higher dietary levels of spermidine were associated with reduced blood pressure and a lower incidence of cardiovascular disease. And then earlier this year, another study came out that correlated human dietary consumption, here using data from the Brunex study, with enhanced cognition and reduced risk of cognitive impairment. Now, these human studies are purely correlation, not causation, so it's important to bear that in mind. A small randomised controlled clinical trial has been done showing improvements in cognition after three months, and other trials are in progress and will look at a variety of markers, and I'll put the link to that in the description. So where does spermidine come from? Well, interestingly, spermidine is something our cells can already synthesise, but there are two other ways we can get spermidine. Secondly, through bacteria in our guts that can generate spermidine, and lastly, as kind of alluded to, through our diet. Spermidine-rich foods include wheat germ, which I've never eaten, natto, soybeans, cheese, mushrooms, and peas. Now, depending on how you process your foods before eating and what you eat, you may already be consuming around 5 mg to 26 mg per day. So whilst there are supplements available, I think in the majority of cases so far, there would be no reason to supplement. Plus, unlike with AKG, there is very limited human data available to see whether spermidine supplementation can improve different ageing biomarkers. But given that it's something we already can consume and isn't apparently toxic, I thought it should be on my list. And then lastly, I've chosen metformin. Why? Well, for similar reasons to the others, it's been shown to increase lifespan in different model organisms, albeit it didn't extend lifespan in mice tested by the interventions testing program. Metformin is already FDA approved and prescribed for type 2 diabetes and polycystic ovary syndrome. In terms of human data for aging, I think still the most striking data comes from this 2014 study that showed patients with type 2 diabetes taking metformin had longer survival than did matched non-diabetic controls. My reservations are with understanding exactly how metformin is functioning within the body and somehow activating this protein AMP kinase, which can impinge on mTOR signaling that we saw earlier. Also with the side effects, I'm working out the correct dosing and timing, but these are something that randomised controlled clinical trials can assess. And in particular, a trial to test metformin for ageing, the targeting ageing with metformin TAME trial, is still in the works and hopefully soon that trial can get started to give us some more data to really evaluate the efficacy of metformin. So there you have it, my five current most promising anti-aging compounds. This is my list from last year and this year, so as you can see it has changed slightly, but my mind hasn't changed too much. 
Importantly, none of this is advice, just my scientific understanding and fun opinion on them, as I've honestly not had a chance to read every single study ever conducted on all the different purported Dura protectors. So if you want, list your top five below, it's always interesting to read your comments, and I'll see you back here with another list in 2022. So with that, I hope you've learned something in this video, thank you to my Patreon supporters, and thank you for listening.